Welcome. I am calling to order the, this meeting of the Assembly Health Policy Committee, Wednesday, October 17th. We are noticed from 12.30 until 1.30, but we can go ahead and continue on until 1.45 if we need, since there's nothing else scheduled afterwards. Let's go ahead and start by identifying ourselves for the record. Um, Krista, if you'd start. Oh, Krista, for office. Natasha Pineda, Health Department. Fred Dyson, Assembly. Courtney McClellan, Health Department. Amy Dugan, Health Department. Christopher Constant. And you're going to represent my husband, Ms. Ray. Eric Croft. And if we could also have the folks in the back identify themselves. Sorry. Okay. Sure, sorry, in the back. Oh, oh okay. Pick up with the health department. Uh, Jody goes for the park. Steve Ashton with Health and Human Services. You didn't mention the health department. Carlos Sippen with the health department. Shane Dwyer, health department. Natalie Wilson, legal assistant. Thank you. So agendas are in back along with, I believe, a copy of a draft ordinance for the for item C on the agenda. We've got three items on today's agenda. Um, we'll start with a director's update, DHH director's update by Natasha Pineda, and then move on to continue our discussion on infectious diseases, namely STIs, and then move into a presentation and discussion of toxic flame retardant chemicals with um, <coughs> Sue Chan from the Alaska Community Action on Toxics. Just a quick recap of our last meeting in September, we discussed and took a look at the Vera Health Clinic. It's too soon to tell as far as cost saving goes since they've only been open for six months, so we will be revisiting this topic in April. Um, we also began a discussion last time on infectious diseases and had a presentation by DHHS focusing on mumps. We heard from Mr. Mumps, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And before 2017, one case of mumps in Alaska, and since then there have been 351 cases in Anchorage. Um, Alaska is one of the least immunized states with a population continuously moving around. So our community immunity has some gaps, especially among the four to six year old age group when it comes to mumps and those young folks being especially vulnerable. Um, Childcare staff are not required by law to be immunized, and in the uh, document we were provided by DHHS, there were some immediate recommendations where the MOA Health Department will implement a comprehensive policy to require appropriate immunizations for DHH employees and review parts of MOA childcare code, as well as explore opportunities, have a more robust vaccination policy, and develop recommendations. And um, given this time-sensitive nature and impact on public health, we have an interest in moving that forward sooner than later. Um, I would like to see this come up before the end of the year. And um, Ms. Pineda, I don't know if you have a timeline or if you give a status update on where you're at with those recommendations. We would like to have those before us, preferably in the form of a draft as far as ordinance mm -hmm. changes go before the end of the year. Okay. So, do you have a status update that you can, I can give on yeah, that I can part? Yeah, I can provide that, and uh, I can do it before I go into my overall area. So, as it relates to an employee uh, immunization policy, we do have a draft version, mm -hmm. and that will go through to legal. I haven't sent it over yet, because we're working on one, another one on something else, and once that goes through, um, then we would need to work with employee relations and all of the implications related to employees to see uh, whether or not that would be a functional or workable policy. Um, in addition, the um, child care code, we've uh, gotten a list of areas, of other areas, if we're gonna amend or propose a change related to something. Uh, Dean and I actually worked together on the child care code revisions in 2018. 16, I think, together. So if we're going to go ahead and do that, there's a few adjustments that we'd like to make in addition. So I'll be working with Blanche Mormon, the division manager, on uh, pulling those together and putting the language cur incorrectly. Okay. So we should be able to have a draft in, uh, by the end of the year. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, thanks. So at this point, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Ms. Pineda, for an update. Sure. And um, after that, we'll move into the second part of the discussion on infectious diseases, focusing on STIs. And um, that'll take us probably about halfway, a little more than halfway through our time, and we'll leave about 25 minutes at the end to talk about toxic flame retard. Uh, well, and I'll try to keep my points brief just so that they have enough time to get through their presentation. Since this is our first run through, I've broken this down into kind of an overview, like a highlight of program areas that would be useful, some discussion about external partners we're working with, and policy updates. Uh, and as we go on, I'm open to other areas that you guys want updates around. Um, first and foremost, we have begun the process of developing a department dashboard. We're, I'm not sharing it with you, but just kind of evidence that we're working on it. There'll be a programmatic dashboard that builds off of our PVRs that you guys get quarterly already, but expands into a few other measures that our leadership team can use to kind of watch progress monthly. Um, since this is a new area we're, we're moving into, uh, it's gonna take us a little bit of time to flesh out what are the right measures, and then we will actually add uh, population level measures that we think are critical for us to be uh, looking at like those things related to substance abuse, domestic violence, and other um, issues related to public health. So more to come on that. Uh, we, Because we are a small organization with very limited resources, we wanted to create something that we could use both internally and also as a way to update the assembly. So we're trying to make sure we can, uh, that it be, meets both needs. Uh, so we will move a draft forward to you guys to get your feedback on areas that you think would be useful so that we build it in. Uh, just on program highlights, our clinical services flu campaign is underway. They've scheduled 23 events this year, and just in six events, they've uh, vaccinated 243 um, folks, which is exciting, and I think their numbers are much bigger, so next next month we'll have a, a good sense of how much we've exceeded our historical uh, flu outreach. Um, during a recent outreach at Brother Francis Shelter, 202 individuals were screened for tuberculosis. In addition, additional outreaches um, in the last month, 194 tests were provided to screen for HIV, Hep C, and STIs. Um, this last month, external partners that we interacted with, the Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, Diane Casto, the executive director, came in, met with our supervisors and did a tour of the facility, and we talked about the kind of the future of uh, funding and how the council will be working and ways that we can engage and partner on that with them. The Mental Health Trust Authority, board, program staff, and executive directors all came to the department for the first time that we can think of in any recent history to receive a presentation from our Aging and Disability Resource Center. They're a partner in funding on that project, and it was a really well-received presentation, and it was nice to have them in the facility, so we think that was a good first step. The Anchorage Community Land Trust, we went, the leadership team, there's, a, there's, a, there's five of us, uh, we actually are starting to do, um, I guess, field trips instead of one of our staff meetings every month go out and actually walk or meet with the community area or partners. So we met with the land trust and we did a walk around Mountain View and just discussed their areas of interest. And so we're going to continue that effort to build relationships with our partners. And in terms of policy updates, obviously flame retardants are the topic of today. So we um, do have a policy position regarding flame retardants and we do support the um, restricting the manufacture, sale, and distribution of those products, and we have a full statement that we'll provide. We're just waiting for one last review, and um, we had a, a staff subject matter expert in our office was able to develop a pretty comprehensive policy recommendation, and we'll get that to you probably this afternoon via email. Um, in addition, we wanted to let you know that uh, the department received a $20,000 grant from the Healthy Babies Bright Future program to decrease exposure of toxic flame retardant chemicals in Anchorage children by offering replacement flame retardant free nap mats um, in the municipality of Anchorage. So with that funding, we're going to purchase and distribute somewhere, this is a big range, I don't know if that's changed, somewhere between 580 and 1,700 mats, depending on the size and price. So we'll be working on that. Um, uh, and in addition, uh, the municipality, along with its partner, Alaska Community Actions on Top 6, will con coordinate the disposal, disposal of the mats that are actually um, contain those toxic chemicals so that they're out of uh, the public's reach. And we will continue doing education on that. Um, and then one last area of updates is around behavioral health, because I know that's an area of interest to you. 
um, on substance misuse. Sarah Richardson, who is our urban fellow, and Elijah Gutierrez, Sergeant Elijah Gutierrez with the National Guard, has been deployed to our office. They are working now in the field, conducting key informant interviews, completing a community uh, a literature review and data collection, and they will um, be convening the first conversation on December 11th, which will be a community conversation, and we're going to probably limit that to 80 people. It will be at the library. More to come on that meeting will be, and uh, they will be available next month to come and present on their progress. Um, and share where they're headed and a little bit of a roadmap on where we're going with that. And then just as an update, we have been working with um, some behavioral health providers and the emergency psych ERs and ERs to get a sense of what the issues were as it relates to crisis stabilization as there is a current procurement out by the state. Um, and that procurement uh, head was very limited in, in how you could apply for it. And so. Uh, we are not moving forward with an application on that. However, on Friday, the Department of Health and Social Services um, activated their department's emergency operations center, um, activating a response in, related to the shortage of psychiatric care capacity in Alaska. And so that's really mobilized um, the community of you know, the state and community partners and crisis stabilization is a part of that. So we will be communicating um, directly to the department what we think you know, the solutions could be based on our conversations with the community. So that's the status on that and there will be more to come on that. Uh, they're, they're, they're meet weekly, there will be communications coming out and we'll be happy to share those communications as relevant with um, City Hall and the assembly. And that is my update. Teresa, any questions? Thank you. Questions or comments from assembly members? I just have an ongoing conversation with Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Ms. Pineda, on the idea of carving out or creating within the division or department a uh, behavioral health focus. And I was, um, I, don't know, I, I don't know the exact emotional response I had when I read the summary page of the budget. And I know you didn't really, that was kind of what was handed to you, but there was something really stunning about it. It's the first two pages of the health department's budget. I highly recommend you read it if you haven't, reread it if you have. And just note what position behavioral health issues play in that summary. Again, I don't point that at you, yeah. I just point that at kind of what's been done. I think most of us who recognize that behavioral health care, mental health, substance use and addiction services is a massive challenge to the health plan in our city, in our state. There isn't even a word to it in the summary. And so if not in the health department, then where? And so it's an ongoing conversation. I'm looking forward to seeing how that evolves. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this last time, but we've been reading through um, Deanna in particular, maybe Shannon, our historical annual reports. And the department did used to have a significant role play mm -hmm. in the behavioral health system as it relates to not only mental health, but alcohol and other substance abuse. and that. I can't quite figure out when that changed, but there's definitely a role to play. There are just not resources, and at this point, I am pretty much the only person in the department that has any experience uh, related to that system. And so in the time, the excess time that I have, which is men, uh, I'm convening and communicating about it and talking about it because I think that we have a role to play in advocating uh, for you know, beneficiaries and just people who live in this city who are being adversely impacted as well by a system that doesn't function to support those people who are in need. And so while we're not resourced to do that right now, I'm definitely got my head down working trying to figure out how to resource that. And the first step was having this urban fellow um, and the state issuing, the public health department really issuing Sergeant Gutierrez to work with us for the next four months at no cost to us um, to really put our kids together and write down what are the needs and document them and speak to everyone. So they're going to be doing key informant interviews. They're, they're doing three a day, I think, and they'll be doing multiples every single day. They'll be reaching out to you so that we can at least create a case for why there should be resources allocated to this in the health department. Okay. I have to make some quick yes. comment. But my anecdotal theory of why is because it's the most complex and difficult issue and people have an aversion towards facing the complex. Right? When you can focus on this and this and this, and you have some sense of resolution with that one. It's Sorry definitely a complex problem. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Mr. Constant. Thank you, Ms. Pineda. Yes. Mr. Dyson and Mr. Croft? Yeah, not now, but 
I'm going to want you to tell me what you think about a piece of legislation I'm working on that criminalizes the knowing, reckless transmission of the disease. Yeah, so we received the printout from your public policy, yep. and we haven't seen any um, any ordinance or legislation or anything that you've written up yet, but our team will be writing up a response uh, yep. to you, but we won't have that prepared today. Yep. No, so I don't expect you to, and we're going slow, yeah. but okay. I would ask you, encourage you to uh, look around the country what people in your position, and you probably have a professional organization and stuff, yep. see if the issues come up what folks' <coughs> thoughts about it from a professional perspective and the results. Yes, we absolutely will respond and provide you with the policy recommendation. All right, thank and you. No and problem. I will listen and pay attention. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Dyson. Mr. Croft? Um, on the 4 days um, needle exchange and our participation in it, I, I <coughs> was part of the crew or, or started the conversation with uh, to talk to your predecessor into that. I still think it's appropriate to say that. I meant to, on my graphic list of things to do, to provide a set of questions. At one point, they asked questions, anonymous, but still information gathering of the people that use that service. I don't know if they still have. I would like you to consider urging them to do it, because it's clear we, a, a heroin epidemic has snuck up on us, and we're just now realizing all the ramifications of it. It's, and it's also clear to me that it's very hard to get good information on it. We, we know heroin deaths, generally. We know heroin seeds. Um, and we, we have a couple of other imperfect insights into how much is being used up. Heroin deaths could be a bad, uh, a bad batch, right? Or, or um, contributing to that. Heroin seeds could be better law enforcement. So neither really give us a good picture of how much usage is going up and what's happening. So questions like, um, when did you start? Want, so how long have you been using? Um, uh, are you interested actually in, uh, in treatment or is this something you want to do? I'll, I'll try and throw my uninformed first draft of those questions. I'm sure your okay. people can do much better. But I, I continue to think that it's an important data point in an area that it's really hard for us to get very good data. Not Thank you, Mr. Croft. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I would just add that next month we will be focusing on substance abuse, <coughs> misuse, detox, treatment issues, and other items that we have um, based on member input for topics. Uh, for example, in December we may discuss public restrooms, water quality of MOA streams, perhaps needle disposal issues, a health and wellness tax, January, possibly food safety, foodborne illnesses, inspections, and February, a discussion on resiliency. We'll be returning to the topic of vaccinations, hopefully before year's end, and as I mentioned, to the Vera Clinic and any cost savings. And so if um, members have ideas for topics or anything of interest you want the committee to look at, please send your suggestions me through the clerk's office. Okay, so we are now on item B, returning to infectious diseases, STIs. So please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you for having us here to talk about this important public health topic. My name is Amy Dugan. I am a public health nurse with the municipality. My colleague Courtney McClellan and I will be presenting some information about STI incidents um, in Anchorage and some of the ways that our clinic is dealing with it. So we always like to start by being mindful of our mission, which is to be a leader and a partner in promoting health and well-being in the Anchorage community. This next slide just lists some of the CDC essential public health services, all of which we try to cover in our clinic. And then I wanted to start by talking about who we serve because I think this is a particularly relevant topic when you're talking about things um, such as STIs because many of the people that we see in our clinic wouldn't be able to seek care elsewhere. 90% of our clients fall below 250% of the federal poverty level and 74% are uninsured, which means that if they are feeling sick, they often can't afford to go to the doctor. They come to us or they go to the emergency room. Those are their choices. 57% are female and 32% are aged 15 to 24, 
which is relevant because this is the age group that is most affected by the rise in STI rates. Um, we do, in addition to clinic-based care, community outreach and partnership, and we have reached out to um, youth organizations to do youth education, um, the LGBTQ community. We do outreach there through identity, um, women's health outreach. Um, we go to Awake, we go to the Hope Center, we go to Highland Mountain Correctional. Um, we have been reaching out lately to the IV drug user community through 4As. We have a um, outreach that we do there. We shoot for once a month, um, going there to provide STI testing. And that was unintentional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the homeless population, we recently did an outreach at Brother Francis Shelter, which Ms. Pineda referenced in her presentation. So sexually transmitted infections in Alaska, there's three main takeaways we want people to have from our presentation today. The first is that they're a really big problem up here. Anchor or Alaska is number one in the US for per capita sexually transmitted infection rates overall. So that's over the course of all of the diseases that we're gonna be talking about today. Second point is that it's not going away. The numbers are rising in both Alaska and the United States and they are continuing to rise. And the third point is that we are trying to um, address the problem through prevention, testing, and treatment. Okay, um, so we'll start with chlamydia, because as you can see, we're number one in chlamydia. We have the highest rate at 800 per 100,000 population. Um, gonorrhea is similar, we're second in the, in the US. Um, and then how that's been changing over time, you can see the chlamydia rate is pretty stable, but rising and has been above the national um, average for quite a while. Gonorrhea, you know, some ups and downs, but right now we're in a pretty high uptick of cases of gonorrhea. Um, so a little bit about those two infections. They're both caused by bacteria. Um, they behave similarly in the body and have kind of seen effects of kind of clumping together. Um, for, for these infections, most people actually don't have symptoms, so they don't know that they are infected, but they can still pass the, the infection along, which is what makes them so common. Um, it, people do have symptoms, it's, it's like burning, discharge, pain, things like that, and then they will come in to get treated. Um, the problem is that if these infections go untreated in women, um, kind of they're in there silently doing damage to the organs and they can cause pelvic inflammatory disease which leads to infertility and then if a woman can get pregnant it can lead to ectopic pregnancy which is very dangerous. Um, if a woman does get pregnant and has one of these infections there's a higher risk of complications during the pregnancy um, at birth like preterm birth or low birth weight babies and then also problems for the newborn um, such as eye infections or lung infections. So, What's an ectopic? Ectopic, so it's a pregnancy outside of the uterus, and it, the body can't, can't manage that, so it can cause hemorrhage and things like that. One um, more question, yeah. Mr. Croft? Depressing statistics. Yeah. I mean, uh, is there an average use? It looks like we're somewhere around twice the national. What is the national average? <coughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, it just roughly looks like we're at 800 on Columbia and maybe 500 is yeah, oops, sorry. I don't know the number exactly, but yeah, about twice as high for chlamydia. Yeah. <coughs> okay. um, as you probably know, uh, it's gonorrhea and chlamydia are both um, transmitted through sex, but um, some people don't know. It's all forms, so oral, anal, and vaginal sex, and it can be transmitted from the mother to the fetus or newborn. Um, the good thing is it can be treated with antibiotics. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to uh, get this messy, but uh, I suspect some of those transmissions uh, or, and activities, it's easier to transmit. Yeah. So, and I suspect, maybe on each of these, you, could you comment if there's a difference between the transmission male to female or female to male? Um, it wouldn't necessarily be an issue of male to female or um, male to male, but certain sexual activities have been found to be riskier for transmission of certain infections. Yes. 
Um, for instance, the one that I can think of off the top of my head is that they have found that anal sex is riskier when it comes to transmission of HIV than vaginal or oral. Right. I don't know if that's the case of gonorrhea or chlamydia, but we can certainly find out and get you that information. Yeah, so it would have seen, seemed to me that there's more transmission from male to female than there is from female to male and having to do with fluids you know, and so on and so forth. Um, I actually, I'm afraid I can't answer that for you today. Um, it does seem like that might be a possibility. Uh, like I said, we can get you that information if you would like, like some statistics on the transmission rates, female to male versus male to female. Well, yeah, and all we're interested in is solving problems. Of course. You know, yeah, stopping the transmission and so on and so forth. Of course. Yeah, so having the best information you've got will help us be smarter about helping you do that. Sure. No, absolutely. And I agree. You can't overestimate our ignorance. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank Dyer. you. Okay, so I may have mentioned it, but um, both of these infections can be cured with um, usually a one-week course of antibiotics. So, so it's quite hopeful. Okay, HPV, human papillomavirus. Uh, most people have heard of this one through the, the vaccine that exists for it. It's the only um, STI we have, well, one of the only, that there's a vaccine for it. Um, HPV, actually most um, sexually active people will get it in their lifetimes, uh, but most of those people clear it on, on their own. The problem with it comes when it stays, uh, when it's a persistent infection in the body, and that can lead to precancerous cell changes and then cancerous cell changes later on. Um, it can also cause genital work. Um, and the cancers that it causes are both in men and women. It's not just a female um, issue. So it's transmitted through oral, anal, and vaginal sex. Um, as I mentioned, there is a vaccine for this. And uh, the vaccine, we like to give it, the recommendation is to give it in the preteen years, around 11 or 12. And that's for two reasons. One is because you want to get the vaccine in before there's any sexual activity. But um, even more so, we find that there's a stronger immune response at those ages. So if the kids get the vaccine 11 to 12, they're going to be better protected against HPV later on. Um, so we also do cervical cancer screening um, at the clinic, and we do uh, wart removal and referral for cancer screening. Um, questions yeah. for you, Mr. Costa? I just didn't know if there was a change of policy on this nationally this last week. Yeah. So. Yeah, so um, the vaccine was only approved for people between the ages of well, 9 and 26, and that's been extended. So now, um, I think it's up to 40, in the 40s, yeah, I think to 45. Now, we don't have a, um, in the clinic, we don't have a, an order drafted to address that yet, because it's just so recent, but we hope to. And we have been joined by Mr. Dunbar. Okay, so um, HIV AIDS, um, for this uh, infection, we do actually have a low incidence in Alaska, but we still do get new cases every year, so we have to pay attention to it, obviously. Um, last year, there were 29 newly diagnosed cases um, with help from the state. 93% uh, of those uh, newly diagnosed people were linked to care quickly, and 72% of them achieved viral suppression through medication, and what that means is the medication um, brought their the amount of virus in them down enough to make them healthier, less likely to get infections, and less likely to pass the virus along. Um, one thing with HIV, it kind of highlights the importance of testing on a routine basis and a risk basis. Um, only 28% of the new cases last year were diagnosed based on symptoms. The other 72% um, were caught during testing at uh, someone came in for another STI, or they had risk factors, or their partner maybe tested positive or they were just having their routine HIV screening. So it kind of highlights how important um, testing is. Um, most people are familiar with HIV, AIDS. Um, often there are no symptoms in the early stages. It can take years for it to progress to a point where people's immune systems are weakened enough for them to start getting a wide variety of infections and complications. Um, it's transmitted through sex as well, oral, anal, vaginal sex. The risk um, with HIV varies um, depending on the type. It's also blood borne transmission, um, which includes needle sharing, and it can be transmitted from a mom to a fetus uh, or newborn. Is that? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dyson. That's, that's fine. 
So it been represented to me that with treatment we have available that a uh, person with the HIV can be treated to the point that they will not be transmitting the disease. Is that true? Yeah, so we know that the risk with complete viral suppression through use of antiviral medication is essentially nil for transmission for somebody that is being ideally virally suppressed. And that's one of the reasons why treatment is so necessary, not just for the health of the individual sure. with the virus, but also to help keep it from spreading. Um, I, before you get done, uh, I want you to answer two questions. One is, once people are diagnosed and know that they've got the issue, does their habits change? And are they more likely to be responsible about their relationship in the future? Secondly, aren't hepatitis A, B, and C transmitted sexually? And if so, why not? Aren't they here? So I'll speak to, to um, the B and C can be, but um, we, we chose not to include hepatitis C in here for time, and also because it's primarily transmitted through um, through blood. The, it's, there's a low incidence of getting hepatitis C through sex, so we kind of left it out. But. The main oh. risk factor for hepatitis C transmission is um, bloodborne, so it would be like sharing needles, and I'd be drug user okay. who shares needles. Good answer. All right, thank you. Okay, and we have a question from Mr. Dunbar. Thank you. How much do these drugs cost? A lot. Um, they are very expensive. I would have to look up the actual cost of them for you. Um, I know that it has been a struggle. The state, I believe, does subsidize the cost because they recognize the public health benefit of having people have access to medication and being virally suppressed. I know that Medicaid will cover them, um, as will, I believe, all all or most private health insurance plans. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Consist? In addition to that, um, for the previous exposure medication, it's roughly $15,000. Mm -hmm. And that's for pre exposure prophylaxis, which we can talk about a little more if anybody would like us to. Thank you, Mr. Consist. So now Amy will talk more about our new friend syphilis. Right. So I get to talk about syphilis. Syphilis traditionally in Alaska has not been an STI that we've been um, had a particular problem with. In fact, in 2017, we only had 23 cases in the entire state. Um, I believe it was the lowest or second lowest per capita rate of all of the states within the United States. Unfortunately, that trend is changing, and we now have a big problem with syphilis. As you can see from the graph up here, in 2017, we had those 23 cases. In 2018, there were 24 cases between January and March. We don't have official figures um, going through the present day because they have to be vetted by the CDC, I believe, before we can issue them. But I did speak with the STD program coordinator at the State Division of Epidemiology, and they confirmed that we have now investigated over 60 cases of syphilis this year and we're still only in October. Also, anecdotally, in our clinic, we have gotten three new positives just since last Thursday. So syphilis is an STI, a bacterial STI, like chlamydia and gonorrhea. It's different in the sense that it is systemic. It will be found in the bloodstream rather than a localized infection. It's a disease that presents in stages, and the um, symptoms depend on the stage. In the primary stage, the only symptom is usually a sore called a chancre. The sore will appear at the site of inoculation, so the place where the bacteria has entered the body. Since it's sexually transmitted, there are usually four sites of inoculation. There's the mouth or the throat, the vagina, the penis, or the rectum. Problem with chancres is that they're painless, and so if you have them in a site that's not visible, you often don't realize they're there. The reason this is an issue is that people can continue to have sex, and while they have a chancre, they are contagious. The second um, stage is secondary syphilis. The rash um, is the sort of the common sign of secondary syphilis. The sort of hallmark is a rash that particularly occurs on the palms of the hands and the feet. 
However, syphilis has been called the great pretender because all of the symptoms of syphilis, no matter what stage, mimic the symptoms of probably literally hundreds of other diseases. Unless you're looking for it, it can be very hard to diagnose symptomatically. Um, when it gets more complicated, syphilis can turn into neurosyphilis which is syphilis that affects the brain. Um, that can affect either the motor portion of the brain, so problems with balance, locomotion, or it can affect the cognitive center of the brain, problems with memory, um, problems with mood swings, um, basically a number of different neurological presentations. Uh, it can also get into the eye and cause permanent blindness and can affect the heart and other organs. One of the things we worry most about with syphilis is um, congenital syphilis. Syphilis can be passed to a fetus um, by a mother who is infected while she is pregnant. The CDC estimates that up to 40% of the time, a woman who is pregnant with a child that has congenital syphilis will have a stillbirth. Those children will not be born alive. Of the 60% of children who are born alive, they have a number of long-term complications. Um, including uh, developmental delays. Mm -hmm. They can have seizure disorders, and they're more likely to die in infancy than other children. Syphilis also causes an increased susceptibility to HIV. So I've talked about transmission. Um, you can get it sexually. You can get it vertically from a mother to a fetus. Uh, the night, to the extent there's a nice thing about syphilis, it's very easily treated and cured by penicillin. Most people only need one injection. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the most severe form, they may need a series of three injections, one per week for three weeks. But that is totally curative. Okay, thank you. And we will need to move quickly. To I'm sorry. No, yeah. this is fascinating and very important, and we're just running a little bit short on time. Okay. Um, and we definitely want to get to any policy recommendations mm -hmm. we have. So, okay. Um, then I'll just touch briefly on this next slide, which is why the rates are going up of STIs. And there's a number of different um, things that have been identified as being components of that. The first is that there are still um, a lot of stigma associated with many STIs, and that can be a barrier to seeking care. And the way that we try to address that in our clinic is to provide good education, to use a non-judgmental approach in interviewing, um, ensure patient confidentiality as is required by federal law, and preserve the dignity of the patient. Lack of access to education is also a huge, huge issue. Um, lack of awareness of our high STI rates, lack of access to care, as we discussed, um, our poor and uninsured clients. Substance use, as was, was talked about earlier, that can also increase high-risk behavior. And then Alaska youth in particular, we find, are engaging in some high-risk behavior, which um, is important because the STI rates are going up the fastest among 15 to 24-year-olds. So what are we doing about it? This is where we get into kind of the meat of it. Um, these are the things that we're currently doing to try to stem the growing tide of STIs in Anchorage. We provide clinic-based abstinence and safer sex education. Everyone who comes into the Reproductive Health Center for a clinic visit is um, interviewed and counseled for risk factors for STIs. They are offered testing. Testing is performed, and if necessary, they are offered treatment. We also do a lot of outreach, community youth education, um, ASD, modified STI and contraceptive education through the eighth grade health classes, and then targeted condom dispersal in various community locations. We also do testing. We do routine and risk-based testing in the clinic, and we also do a lot of different outreach events. I mentioned earlier the ones with identity and four A's where we're targeting specifically high-risk populations and offering free testing for the STIs that we've discussed. We're also assisting the state of Alaska with the antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea monitoring that they are doing at the behest of the CDC. Treatment, we do provide medication in clinic for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, often at low or no cost. Um, so we can treat people in clinic, and we can also occasionally do field treatment, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, for HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C, we do not carry the medication in clinic, but we do refer people to care for those conditions. And then finally, um, decreasing financial barriers. Many of the clients we see in our clinic end up paying nothing based on our income sliding scale. Um, the final thing that we do is disease intervention. I wanted to talk a little bit about this. My formal title with the health department is disease intervention specialist. 
This has two components. The first thing that we do is contact investigation. So anybody who comes into our clinic testing positive for gonorrhea, for chlamydia, for syphilis, or for HIV is notified and brought to treatment. Our goal is that 95% of the time, positives in our clinic will receive treatment within two weeks. For the first quarter of the last fiscal year, we actually exceeded that. 96% of people who tested positive in our clinic were treated within two weeks. The other aspect of that is partner notification and services. And this touches on what Mr. Dyson was asking about earlier. Um, when people come in, they are interviewed about their partners. And for gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV, we do offer partner notification. So I will get the information, I'll call the partner. Confidentially, we will say you may have been exposed. We won't tell them by who. Um, and then we will get them in and um, treat it or link to care. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kropp and then Mr. Dyson? Well, um, and then Mr. Constant. I'm wondering what the effect of the idea that you know, Senator Dyson was talking about where if, there's, if it's defined as a crime, whether you think you're going to get more or fewer people telling the partners they've had. Yeah, that would certainly be a concern. Um, our ability to do our jobs depends on people being willing to come to us and trust us with the information that they give us, trust us to test them, trust us to treat them. And so without reading the specific legislation that Mr. Dyson is proposing, I can't put forward a, a, an opinion on that specifically. But anything that could have a chilling effect on that would certainly be something that would be of concern. And I believe, um, Director Pineda, did you want to yeah, respond? Yeah, in terms of being able to respond comprehensively to the question that Mr. Dyson put forward initially, and I think given the same thing as what Mr. Um, we are going to be working on an actual policy recommendation related to the concerns, but we aren't prepared to present that today okay. because we are waiting for more information about the, what that's going to look like. Okay. But we can provide some general thoughts about our sure. concerns about it. I think the nurse, nurse okay. maybe explain that. Thank you. Really. And in the interest of time, I would ask the committee to consider, well, go ahead, Mr. Dyson. Oh, yeah. You. So, in this fits for you your overall responsibility. Ten years ago, when I was talking to public health nurses and school nurses and stuff, they said, got this dilemma, you know, if I tell that this kid knows I'm liable to rat out her 24-year-old boyfriend, she won't talk to me. And But our state law requires if it's suspected child abuse, it doesn't report it. Uh, and I understand both of them. The nurse says, I may be the healthiest adult contact this girl has, you know, and if we lose that. So that's a, a moral, ethical, and a legal question, you know, and I'm wanting our, for us to do the very best thing, think about big picture. But stopping the transmitters from being the local franchise distributor has got to be a high priority for us as well. So yeah, tell me what yeah, to do. On a policy level, we think the best way to be doing that, in addition to what we'll issue as we review, okay. is continuing to fund and uh, support the work that the nurses are doing, uh, the investigations that they're doing, the contact communication, the you know education that's happening. And the more we do, the more we invest in that, the more likely that we will be. I got it. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Oh, no. Thank you, Mr. Dyson. Mr. Constant, yeah. and then we will need to move on to the next just part just of the Just kind of to the point, what's the wait time? Someone decides they want to come in because they suspect something's gone wrong. Is it instant, immediate for them to find a test at the clinic, or um, what's the lab? Sometimes we can get them in the same day. Um, if they're a known contact to an illness, I will usually work a little harder to shoehorn them into the schedule. Um, I believe that Mr. Sippen actually has statistics on what we call our third next available, which is how they judge the um, wait time at a clinic. Anecdotally, um, lately it's been pretty fast. Um, sometimes there may be a wait of a few days based on whether they need to see a nurse practitioner, because we have fewer of those versus a public health nurse. Right, because to me that seems like one of the key factors. Mm -hmm. if somebody is ready, willing, and able to be tested, that, that decision may be Thank you. Yeah, and just to add in too, um, so one thing that we do strive for is we do not want to turn anyone away. So we do have to flex capacity to see, see, uh, see 
folks same day. Um, but we do keep a very close eye on what our throughput is. Um, and just last week, um, our third next available uh, is two to three days. Um, so that's third next available. So I do the first next available will probably be the same day as well. Um, but we have seen that um, wave and kind of increase depending on how much outreach we do, what type of uh, public uh, attention is drawn on. We do a lot of outreach. So just off of doing a handful of different outreaches, we do see a lot of folks that come in and we say, we saw you out in the community. Thank you very much for educating us. So is it a resource question? We'll often the pushes that line out. Um, Thanks for that. <laughs> okay. I've lived in Anchorage my whole life. I've, I've lived here for 29 years, and I've seen a lot of different changes. Um, I, myself, have used the health department for a variety of different things. Thankfully enough, I haven't had to use the um, you know, reproductive health clinic, but I have, a, have um, had a lot of friends that have needed that. I can't, I mean, I don't know what the third next available is for Planned Parenthood, um, but just being able to meet the community where they're at, being able to mobilize quickly for a variety of things is very, very important. Um, we are, you know, the first time that we've ever gone out to Kirkwood, Kirkwood is within the municipality. We went out there just last week and we did flu shots and the community was very, very positive for that. Um, and STD testing. testing as well. Um, so uh, at the direction of our great director, um, you know, our marching orders is to expand and grow and to continue to evolve. Um, and folks that we have in the seats. Um, you know, Kobe has been in her spot for about a year, and he's been there for about a year too, but really be able to foster that type of passion and have the resources to meet the demand of the community is what we do. Um, and slowly we are keeping track of what that demand is, so we're starting to see the capacity kind of dropping depending on what the demand looks like. Um, so in terms of resources, we'll keep a close eye on that. So just Thank a quick you. And final yes. note that I personally have never been infected with an STI, but I have used the municipal clinic when I first moved to Alaska when I was young and broke. And I go every year religiously in November to Planned Parenthood for a sexual health screening. And uh, I can tell you that 20 years ago, they couldn't see me here. Planned Parenthood did for free and immediately. And it was just a deep infection in my lungs from coming from DC. But the fact is, they were there. And so in my opinion, we do need a very strong system that takes care of these crisis moments where people have no resource. So I commend you all for your work. Thank you, Mr. Constant. And, and thank you, Ms. Dugan and Ms. McKellen for a very interesting and important um, presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if you do have further policy recommendations to please um, share those with us, we'll be coming back to this topic of infectious diseases. Okay, so. We will likely go over today. We started a little bit late, um, but if the folks who are presenting on the toxic flame retardant chemicals want to go ahead and get started with setting up. Is there anyone here from the public who wanted to testify today? Anybody? Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have some pictures that they're going to use for the next. Um, oh, so I'm just okay. sure. trying to. I have to save them somehow. So. Okay, I'll save them. Sue, do you want to go ahead and grab a spot for here? Maybe? All right. And you have some materials too, right? Yes. Did everybody get a packet?
speed it up. <laughs> um, maybe I can just go ahead with an introduction. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Sue Chan. I'm the Civic Engagement Coordinator with Alaska Community Action on Toxics. Um, just briefly to introduce um, my organization, uh, we're an environmental health and justice research and advocacy group. Um, we have, um, our mission is to um, advocate for clean air, clean water, and toxic free food. And we do that following um, a series of core values that can be found on our website. And um, we do uh, community-based participatory research, we do advocacy, policy work. Um, so yeah, that's an uh, intro to ACAT. So I wanted to talk today about uh, flame retarding chemicals. Literally speaking, they are um, chemicals that contain uh, usually a chlorine or a bromine atom to carbon. Um, they're added to products to meet flam and outdated flammability standards, um, and that includes a range of products from um, upholstered furniture to children's toys, and they have no proven fire safety benefits. And um, in fact, they're known to increase the toxicity of fires instead. And so um, we've actually had this, uh, we have strong support from firefighters as children, pregnant women, and firefighters are at the greatest risk of health harms to these exposures. And um, in addition to that, these chemicals are persistent. So they are found to build up in our wildlife and our uh, bodies. And they're found in our fish, our wildlife, and people in Alaska. Um, I just want to briefly mention that last year, the Consumer Product Safety Commission um, had agreed to ban these chemicals, understanding the health harms associated with these chemicals, but they realized that it would take a long time, so they immediately issued a warning last year saying that these chemicals should not be used by manufacturers, retailers, and uh, importers, um, chemicals or products that have organohalogen flame retardant chemicals. Some of the known health harms associated with these uh, chemicals are uh, reproductive harm, so your ability to have a safe, um, healthy birth, um, neurological impacts such as uh, memory, uh, damage to your memory and learning abilities, as well as your IQ, um, endocrine disruption and your hormone disruption, um, changes or alterations to your genes, cancer, and immune disorders. This is especially relevant for Alaska, despite the fact that we don't have um, factories or uh, manufacturing facilities here. Um, and the reason why is because chemicals don't know boundaries. Uh, they often evaporate from warmer climates and they travel by wind and air currents up to the north. Um, so there have actually been found high levels of these chemicals in um, our northern marine mammals and they've been found in high levels of, um, in our Arctic people as well. Um, and another, in, in addition to that, uh, as Alaskans in cold climate, we spend a lot of time indoors, so we, uh, our homes are usually less insulated, sorry, highly insulated and less ventilated, so we tend to breathe in more dust and more of these chemicals. Um, and so that leads to kind of the question of like, so how exactly are we exposed to these chemicals? Um, so these chemicals are not bound to the plastics or materials that they're put in. They often uh, migrate out um, and they set, they, they attach, sorry, they, they migrate into the air and then they settle into the dust and that's the primary mode of um, exposure. In fact, 20% of the way that we uh, ingest flame retardant chemicals is through butter or, or our diet, like butter, fish, um, seafood, and the rest of the 80% is actually the dust that we breathe in. Um, and the, the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention found that uh, Americans have over 90% of 
sorry, over 90% of Americans have flame retardant chemicals found in their blood. And PDBEs are one of the earlier forms of flame retardant chemicals that have been used. And so there's a lot of scientific evidence for um, PBDE chemicals. Um, and again, just to kind of reiterate, they're associated with thyroid harm, um, harm to your hormones, um, hyperthyroidism, also, of course, um, neuro neurotoxic uh, effects. And um, children often have higher levels of these chemicals because they're on the floor um, exploring, putting their hands in their mouth, and so they're ingesting higher levels of this dust. And so it's been found that toddlers have three to nine times higher levels of these chemicals than their parents. Um, and what's particularly um, concerning is that children at that stage of uh, age, they're developing a lot. Um, so these chemicals have an even greater effect um, on their health and development. And I just want to also add at the last bullet point on there, it says that um, eliminating sources are effective. In fact, there was a recent study done where flame retardant nap mats were replaced with flame retardant free nap mats and they immediately saw a 90% reduction of flame retardant chemicals in the dust of the child care centers where they had done that. And um, of course with the Department of Health and Human Social Services as well, we'll be doing um, our own little study where we'll be swapping out nap mats as well. So um, also to kind of stress the point that this isn't in uh, this isn't a problem that's you know only for those states that are producing these chemicals. This is something that affects us Alaskans as well. Um, in fact, um, the levels of PDE, PDBE flame retardants were found in the Yupik people of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta region um, of Alaska, and they they are known to have the highest levels of these flame retardant chemicals in the circumpolar north. Um, and then um, as ACAT, we've also done some research of our own with um, our community partners at St. Lawrence Island, um, collecting dust and blood serum to um, look at levels of these flame retardant chemicals in the dust, or in households and in um, bodies. So um, birth defects and neurodevelopmental effects. Um, one of the things that has been becoming more known is that flame retardant chemicals are sort of like the new lead. We all know that lead is toxic even at the lowest levels and they have harmful effects. We're finding more and more that flame retardants are the same way. Um, they also readily cross the blood membrane during pregnancy to a developing fetus, uh, which is why it's especially um, concerning for pregnant women. Um, also, just calling to the attention that there's a, Alaska has a, a prevalence of birth defects twice as high as the rest of the nation, and um, Native Alaskan infants have twice the risk of birth defects compared to white infants in Alaska. And uh, children in the highest 20% of exposure distribution to uh, PDBE flame retardants in uh, umbilical cord blood showed uh, lower IQ performance scores by five to eight percent showing that uh, when a pregnant women were exposed to flame retardant chemicals, uh, their babies had lower IQ scores um, due to those exposures. And similar effects were um, observed in wildlife and laboratory animals as well. So um, firefighters are also one of our strongest supporters because um, they are the ones on the front lines fighting fires and being in direct contact with these chemicals um, flame retardants do not, <laughs> there's been studies shown that they do not slow down fires, they do not provide, uh, prevent ignition uh, from fires when they're in the foam uh, and covered with some other fabric. Um, and so, in fact, when they burn, they create more toxics in the smoke that gets released. Um, and so firefighters have been um, found to have two to three times higher levels of flame retardant chemicals in their blood, and firefighters are known to have some of the highest rates of cancer amongst any other profession. Um, some of the rare cancers that often are found are multiple myeloma, 
non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, prostate and testicular cancer. And then also in San Francisco, um, their firefighter uh, department has found that women have had six times the national average uh, level of breast cancer. So just to give a little bit of historical context, why do we have these chemicals everywhere? <laughs> everywhere? Why are they even in Alaska? Um, and it kind of started in the 1970s when smoking indoors was kind of like a regular thing. Um, oftentimes smoking on your bed, not a good idea. It led to an increase in household fires and the tobacco industry was getting a lot of um, pressure from the public to take responsibility uh, for that. And in fact, at that time, there had been a new product, uh, a new kind of cigarette that was self-extinguishing, and there was pressure to the tobacco industry to switch over to this new product. And with the uh, revenue stream they were receiving and the profits that they were receiving, they didn't want to try changing their product and messing with that. So instead, they essentially push the responsibility onto furniture manufacturers saying that this is something, you know, furniture should be flame proof versus cigarettes being self-extinguishing. And so out of that came uh, California's open flame flammability standard, <coughs> TB117, which actually in some of the couches that you may have in your home today, if you flip it over, you should see a label that says, this couch meets flammability standard TB117. <clears throat> and essentially, um, the provisions for that was that foam had to resist an open flame test and not burn in order for it to be considered fire safe. Um, and it was not an effective standard. And in fact, in 2013, they realized that um, it, it wasn't effective and the harms from the chemical exposures did more damage than it, it provided fire safety benefit. And so they altered that standard so that um, furniture can meet in a, a smolder test so that it wouldn't catch on fire in the first place. Um, and, and so that allowed for uh, manufacturers to not have to use chemicals in the foam um, in order to meet these flammability standards. And Sue, so we'll need to jump ahead, I think, yes. now to actions and what you recommend and also the draft ordinance that we have before us. One question that I do have, would you be able to address how prevalent these chemicals are in products within the municipality? Within like the in Anchorage or within the city hall municipality? Um, yes, specifically any idea on how many retailers or mm -hmm. um, the extent to which there are products containing these chemicals? that are for sale in our community? So we've done a little bit of outreach to businesses. Um, I think we definitely could be a little bit more extensive and it's, it's in our plans to do more of that business outreach. But so far we have called several retailers, um, some of them being uh, Mattress Ranch, scan, uh, U-Scan Home, um, and we've called Ashley's, Bailey's, um, and the response that we've been getting is kind of mixed. Um, some businesses say that they don't have flame retardants in their uh, products at all, and they, they want their products to be the best for consumers. Um, other businesses have said, you know, like, I don't even know what that is. Some businesses have said, we just follow California standard. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of been a little bit of a mixed bag. But I know larger retailers such as um, like Walmart, uh, Lazy Boy, they've actually committed to mm -hmm. phase out flame retardant chemicals from their inventory which I actually have a slide here that shows a list of different retailers and manufacturers who have mm -hmm. said they're on board to maybe heard a better path. Okay, and um, maybe you could touch briefly on what's going on at the state level, mm -hmm. and then if we could have Mr. Gates provide an overview of what we're proposing at the community level. Sure. Um, so on the state level, we um, essentially our state bill it provides for a phase out of organohalogen flame retardant chemicals from children's toys, children's products, and upholstered furniture. It would also require labeling uh, so that uh, consumers can know whether their products have flame retardants or not. Um, and then also requesting that the, uh, whichever department that this um, 
uh, policy would go to. They would uh, be a part of an interstate clearing house, uh, which is like a database of chemicals of concern, um, and just have that on the website to refer to. Okay, thank you. And if you don't mind, um, we'll ask Mr. Gates to provide an overview of the draft ordinance. Would you be able to do that? Yes, and what it seeks to do. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> um, basically, it puts together a couple of some um, provisions from other jurisdictions. And um, the whereas paragraphs is two pages almost. And the whereas language is from what Delta provided to us. And uh, so we appreciate it. Uh, they put together a draft ordinance. I think it's that exactly like the for implementation that was happening in the network and uh, to keep our um, costs in uh, administration and implementation to a minimum I instead selected some provisions from an ordinance in San Francisco and a Washington DC ordinance and then this state draft bill Yes, uh, so it may not, that's great, so we draft. <laughs> it may not look like it works around together. And uh, it does definitely need a bit more work. But um, I guess the draft ordinance that put together, the look at uh, page three is where we get into some substantive language, uh, creating a new chapter for consumer protection. And uh, the first section will be displaying target chemicals. So there's room for other consumer protection measures in the future. And you see chapter 16. Uh, from the target chemicals section, um, basically we have six months delayed um, ban on the plain target chemical additives to certain products. And uh, we've in this classified some products <coughs> as, uh, I'm sorry, first D and C is some chemicals. E is very clear and precise, and that is taken from the state draft bill. Um, C is from, I think, San Francisco, and I need to sort of combine the two, so we've got a more understandable, comprehensive list of types of chemicals that we need to make sure are included in this uh, ban. Um, so D is some exceptions for they didn't include this for like some computer equipment or barrows and things like that. This is mostly focused on uh, furniture. We have close to furniture and children's products. And uh, for that reason, you see that uh, in the definitions, I've included several what are called covered products. And that's sort of the catch all that will include juvenile products, which are those children uh, 12 and under that contain the. Uh, Chemical analysis that are being banned, and then uh, real poster furniture and poster furniture. And those are all kind of included in the definition of the product. And so that's kind of the approach I've taken. Uh, there's also a big requirement here, and uh, I, I think that needs to be fleshed out more. That's on page five four in the middle of that. That will require a big whether or not it's a prohibited thing for the community value. It's in any type of fine color chemicals added. It was covered in the list or not. Read the label, it says fine color chemicals are added. And I'm not sure if that's a recommendation. You don't go with, if we're banning fine color chemicals, why would you read the label to ask when? You know, it's going to So that's what I said, whether or not it's banned. So this way, I think, help consumers differentiate between um, products that have no additive at all, which is the direction I think ATAP wants to go and move it off. Thank you, Mr. Gates. And Mr. Constant, you have a comment? Uh, one, from your first point, I think there's a slight scrivener's error that I think it should read flame retardant chemicals. Um, and one group we haven't heard from who's in the room is the fire department. And so I'm hoping we could hear briefly from the fire department. Certainly. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are also in support of the, or in support of the ordinance. Um, our rates of cancer are currently unknown, but we know we do have a higher rate of cancer among firefighters across the nation. Many studies have proven that, and um, getting to the root cause of the exposure 
is what we'd like to do and eliminate some of those chemicals that we're exposed to. At this current point in time, our only option is to either not fight the fire, which obviously we're not going to do that, or to decom and get the chemicals off of uh, our skin as soon as possible. Unfortunately, there is still significant exposure and absorption that happens during the firefighting activities, and we really, the only way to eliminate that exposure is to eliminate the chemicals being within our, you know, within the environment that we're exposed to. We're also very aware that it will take a long time for these chemicals to get out of the environment that we're exposed to. Um, however, we have to start somewhere. So we think this is a good measure to do that. Thank you, Chief. Um, and I would just add to that one of the purposes of today in introducing this draft ordinance is to identify any changes or questions um, and make a list of things that we can work with Dean on to further revise this draft. So, uh, uh, Mr. Dunbar? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm one of the three co sponsors, obviously, so I'm supportive of the, of the idea of the ordinance. I, I do think we need to do more. Um, whether ACAC can help us with that or not, to reach out to the retailers and ask them about their inventories and you know how many of these products do they currently have. It was something that we did when we, for example, banned um, you know, smaller scale the sale of certain kinds of plants, uh, invasive species, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, that was something that my aide and I did was reach out to the retailers and say, okay, how is this really going to affect, affect you? And we found that most of them didn't actually sell this product. One of them did, but they're like, well, we can sell it for this summer and then we'll be done and we won't, we won't buy it again. We won't have that inventory again. I think that's really important. Um, you know, we, we've seen uh, uh, a number of our ordinances that ban things that, that the main pushback we get is about inventory. So I, I do think we need that information. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Any other comments or questions? After hearing from the fire chief, Mr. Christopher, I'd like to be added as a sponsor. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's great. The more sponsors, the better. We are limited by the Open Meetings Act, so we're just going to have to. No, I know, but as we do redrafts and stuff, yeah. we'll it'll we'll have to be like that works and then it pops back up. Yeah. But yeah. Um, and there, just real quickly, um, you know, the I, I sent around just the link to it, but the um, the HBO documentary. Um, Toxic hot seed is incredible on this. John Oliver does a good piece on it as well. Um, it's really an incredible issue. A lot of the manufacturers have voluntarily um, moved away from this, so that um, the you know lead was a thing that was driven by state and federal laws, getting rid of the lead paint. Um, BPA and a lot of baby stuff was a consumer lead, um, and there was never a federal law to ban it. it just and start saying, I don't want that in there now. People advertise BPA free. We're sort of in between on this. We're trying to um, do both awareness and that. But um, the um, Center for Occupational Health out of San Francisco has on its website, so C Environmental Health, CEH, um, has uh, a list of the manufacturers that don't use this already voluntarily. And Ashley. Holmes is one of them here, and Lazy Boy is one of them, and there are others that I can pursue here. So I think we can also, next time around, get some support from the manufacturers and retailers of those manufacturers that have already taken the step and are already um, on board to say we're already not, we're already selling things that are free of this. So I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Croft. Any other comments? I know we've, oh, Mr. Dunbar. Yeah, one thing really quickly. Right now we're in a draft form, um, you know, I'm sure we'll work on this more. I, I think there's actually a benefit to, you know, we'll do this outreach to the retailers, but as we've seen time and time again, sometimes that people don't really notice it until it's actually on the table. Like if we were to introduce this and there were to be an article about it in the paper, then we have a lot of people come and, um, and yell at us. Uh, and there's some, some benefit to that. So I, I think we can do that more outreach and figure out inventories and that kind of thing. But I don't want to let perfect be the enemy of the good. If we get to the point where we're like, okay, we've talked to a lot of people, not everybody, we'll put it on the table, and if there's someone they think is, this is really going to impact their business, uh, hopefully they'll come and, and talk to us. Usually it's like at the last possible minute, I think, is, is most of our experience. Um, but then we can 
perhaps delay an event. But uh, I, I would like to see this introduced in the next couple of months if we can get that outreach done. And Mr. Dunbar, um, do you have a work session scheduled already for this? For this, no. I, I think okay. um, I wanted to have this and see some of that outreach. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I think it'll probably be some time in. We have to work around our MLMP sale and budget mm -hmm. calendars. It would probably be sometime in late November, I would expect. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions from committee members or others present? Apologies for going over by so much. Thank you all very much for being here. We are adjourned.